when someone accidentally threw away the school play costumes, oh no! Replacements were shipped with FedEx, and with picture proof of delivery, everyone could focus on the perfect opening night. FedEx, where now meets next for residential delivery only. Like me, do you get stuck worrying about your business's finances or what needs to be paid to the ATO, employees, super funds, and so on? The Australian Business Podcast is proud to announce that our sponsor, Grayspace Advisory is offering all business owners a financial health check. Jordan and Daniel's expert team of accountants will conduct a review of your tax structure, bank setup, ATO obligations and reporting, as well as business insurance, and provide some advice on how to manage all of this. But get this, it's just $99. No matter where you are in Australia, you can book a $99 health check with the Grayspace team following the link in your podcast player. It's a no-brainer. Tell them Owen sent you. Welcome to the Australian Business Podcast. I'm Daniel Golubev. I'm Jordan Kittis. I'm Owen Rask. We're here to help you make more profit, find work-life balance, save time, capital, and grow your business. Every week, we drop the best tax tips, marketing hacks, growth strategies, and methods to help you grow. If you haven't already, take the free Rask Business Course. Book a chat with me or Daniel at Grayspace. Or get in contact with us about business coaching. We also love hearing from you. So send us your questions and feedback using the resources found in the podcast player for each episode. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome back to the Australian Finance Podcast. I'm your host, Kate Campbell, and today I have a very special guest. Naomi Simpson is an Australian business owner and leader who has really seen it all. From founding Red Balloon, an online marketplace for experiences in 2001, to being a judge on Shark Tank Australia, she is full of insights for us. In today's conversation, we're chatting about her journey as a business owner in Australia over the past few decades, its impact on her finances, her insights on work, and how she thinks about making business decisions, staying ahead. She shares plenty of examples, even her controversial takes. So I think you'll all enjoy this conversation, whether you are interested in starting a business or you're just someone who is curious about the world. I hope you enjoy today's conversation. Naomi, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. That's so my pleasure, Kate. Always happy to chat. (laughs) (laughs) Now, we met uh, about a month ago at a microfinance, women in finance event, and it's my pleasure to have you on the show because you have such uh, a breadth of experience in the world of business, in finance, in getting women involved in their own financial future. So I thought you'd be the perfect guest for today's conversation. We'll talk a bit about your journey, investing, building a business and the kind of legacy you want to leave behind because we had a lot of questions from people who want to do all of these different things but often don't have a role model or someone to look up to that's done it before. So you're the perfect person to speak about all this. But I guess to kick things off, I'm keen to know you've done so many different things. Are there any interesting experiences you've had that you notice have had an impact on your life in a really unexpected way? Look, when I was um, a young graduate, I worked in corporate Australia and I was always kind of, everything was always urgent for me. It's kind of the way that I've operated. But I really would get frustrated. And so whether it was working inside a professional services firm, one of the big four now, Um, or working, I worked for an airline, and said, I just, I couldn't understand why everything took so long. Um, And it was unbelievably frustrating. And also how, as a, you know, young person entering the workforce, it was like I had no idea what was going on. And people would say, I'll do that. And I'd say, you know, but how, why, and where does it all fit in? Um, And I guess I learned, particularly from working uh, at ANSET, uh, how, I didn't want to be. So, I, A, I didn't want to work in that environment because it was frustrating. But secondly, I watched managers and their lack of kind of clarity. And yet when I joined Apple after being at Ansett, you couldn't get a more different company. Like it was so purpose-driven, even back in the day, so purpose-driven. And everybody knew exactly why they were there and what they were there to do. And when I was at Ansett, I used to hang around outside my off of my manager's office, hoping that I could get a little bit of attention and find out what was next or where to go or how did I do something. 
Whereas when I was at Apple, it was just a rhythm of communication. So I knew that every Monday I had a one-on-one with my manager. So we'd save up all my questions. I'd work everything out. And it was just so much more productive. So I guess um, I didn't realise that those bad, um, really some terrible kind of experiences with managers. Like back in the day, when I was at ANSET, they all used to smoke in the office. I was the only woman kind of in that area. And then they just closed the door with six people smoking. Like you can't imagine it. <laughs> we can't imagine it. Like you hold it well. Um, so I learned about how I didn't want to be. And I think it's just as I probably wouldn't have respected the um, processes and the rhythm of communication and the sense of purpose at Apple if I hadn't have had some pretty unfortunate experiences. I mean, I literally, when I was at ANSET, had did a whole bunch of customer research, I came back to present it, and I literally had my manager say, that's nice, you go and worry your pretty little head about something else. I mean, unbelievably patronising. So, yeah, I knew I was never going to say that to anyone. No, it's interesting. Sometimes you learn more about what you want out of work and your career by working in a really bad environment to start with, don't you? I know, and it was awful at the time, and I would whinge and complain to my friends, and they would say, well, why don't you just leave? Um, But I was enjoying the kind of business travel of where I was working, and, you know, I hadn't been there long enough. I shouldn't leave until I've got enough experience. It would look bad bad on my CV. Um, And I do think that there – I know this sounds awful, but I do think that um, we can give up too easily because – I got some incredible outcomes also when I was working there. I got to work on the team that launched Frequent Fly in Australia. It was the first loyalty program. Um, I launched the first ever co-branded credit card in Australia um, and I got like a 70% response rate to a direct mail. Never happened. So I did get to work on some incredible stuff, but it was unbelievably frustrating. Um, But I had to stick at it too. And at the time, I just didn't realise that, you know, Fast forward 20 years, I would become a best employer because of just our ability to listen to people and have a rhythm of communication. Was it your experience at Apple that sort of kick-started that entrepreneurial drive in you? Uh, yeah, yes and no. I unfortunately had happened to work at Apple when um, Steve Jobs didn't. But there was such an entrepreneurial essence inside the business. Um, and it was very, very um, focused. And, and so I think maybe not. Um, entrepreneurial but more um, very focused and focused delivers outcome um, over and over and so entrepreneurship really probably came for me because my father was a business owner many of my friends had gone freelancing had left the corporate life but ultimately I didn't really I didn't even think about myself as an entrepreneur until like I'd had red balloon for five years and somebody called me that and I thought that they were trying to offend me because <laughs> Entrepreneur back in my day was a rude word, you know. It oh, was really? uh, kind of a fly-by-nighter. We had Scase and Bond and all of those rich characters uh, when I was coming out of university and they were labelled entrepreneurs. So, no, that is not something I wanted to be. I wanted to be a business owner, which is kind of you might think is different. I'll jump into your journey to starting Red Balloon and being a business owner in a second, but one of the things that really sort of caught me by surprise on your website is you have a list of the things you believe and most people wouldn't write down the things they believe and post it so publicly like that. So I was wondering what led you to sort of putting that up there and maybe if you could share one or two of these and how that shaped your own journey. Look, I think um, we live in a world where um, we can't, I chose to be a role model. I'm really clear that I had incredible role models when I was growing up, Um, one of which is one of Australia's great entrepreneurs, to use that um, term, a woman by the name of Lindsay Catamol who founded a business um, called Aspect Computing and then she sold it to Kaz and then it became part of Telstra. But just this incredible – and my mum worked for her and my mum was a business analyst and had worked on one of the first computers in Australia. So I was surrounded by these incredible women What I didn't know was how unusual that was. That was just my normal. And then when I started my own business, I found a lot of young people who had joined our business who were really struggling and juggling. And they might have, you know, been in a committed relationship, but they found they were doing all the domestic work. And I go, that's not how it works, you know. 
And so, um, in fact, when I was asked to do Shark Tank, it was I, Carol Schwartz, another great entrepreneur, um, she, I, I was catching up with her and I said, oh, can you imagine they've asked me to do a reality TV show? We're like, why on earth would I do that? You know, I've worked really hard on my business reputation. She said, tell me about it. I told her about it. And she said, so wh- why wouldn't you do it? You know, you're helping businesses and so forth. And I said, well, it could hurt my reputation. And a lot of people really worried about worry about that. And, and so then I said, and she said, oh, I thought, um, that you wanted to be a role model for other people. And I said, yes, of course. Well, she, she said, so a million people are going to watch that. Like, what? why would you not do it? And so sometimes we need to be challenged to greatness. But then people kind of want to know who you are and what you stand for. And people have all their absolute own ideas. In fact, Kate, I'm sure you had your own ideas about who I was before I showed up and we met each other. And so I think to make some statements in public about, you know, I believe in giving people a fair go. Um, Interesting, a a report came out this week, a a gender compass report, which is really interesting to look at. But the reality is that we as Australians no longer have the same definition of what is fair. So when you say give somebody a fair go, what does that really mean? And so I think that language is important. But having some beliefs also helps me guide guide me on where I want to spend my energy. Like I I believe in supporting and dragging other people with me on this journey, men and women, of sharing what I've learned. Yesterday I had a speaking engagement, which was absolutely wonderful, for small businesses in Bayside in Victoria. And um, my speaker's agent happened to be there and the woman sitting next to her was taking copious notes and Vicky just said could you share those notes with me and then she sent them to me and it was literally a business course in 50 minutes like if you have to do one thing what's the one thing what's the one thing you should know right now about AI what's the one thing you should know right now about cyber security what's the one thing you you know it's just like writing furiously so I never know Um, and at the same event this woman came up to me and she said my daughter saw you speak in 2007 And she said, you forever changed the way she saw herself and saw what her opportunity was. I am forever grateful. So you never know who you're going to impact. And so you do just keep having to show up. But having some belief statements kind of lets people know what they're going to get. We sometimes forget how impactful our actions and the words and the the values we live out can be on the people around us. And that's something we talk a lot about on the podcast is how the actions you take with your finances and the ripple effect that has on your friends and family and community. So it's interesting to sort of see that from a different perspective as well, because I sort of focus on that on the financial side of things, but just in terms of having role models in the world of business and just life, really. (laughs) And when they realise I'm I'm not that clever, I'm very ordinary, um, it's, it's, they, there's a sense of relatedness, you know, mm. and being relatable is really important. I think, you know, one of my things is just staying curious and keep learning and asking questions. And every time I say to myself, oh, I'm too old to learn anything new, I said, <laughs> well, you get on with it, girly, because, you know, that's what will leave you behind. So remaining uh, curious and it, I think is fundamental to us growing as humans um, and learning and discovering. I love that. Now, if people aren't that familiar with you and your story, are you able to give us a brief rundown on your entrepreneurial or small business journey starting Red Balloon and Shark Tank? I don't know if you can do it in like a couple of minutes. (laughs) Yeah, let's try and keep this brief. I'll try and cram 25 years into two minutes. Yes. Um, I left left corporate life when I had children a long time ago. They bought themselves up very nicely. They're contributing members of society. But I wanted more flexibility and you just couldn't get it in those days. And I figured I could go freelancing as a marketer because I've been a professional marketer my whole career. Um, And what I realised in designing these marketing programs was that actually small businesses, sure, that brand stuff sounds really nice, but what I really just need is customers. And um, the other thing is if you're in the consulting world, it's feast or famine. Even still, even with all of the online services and everything, you've either got too much work or not enough. And so I wondered if I could flip flip the model, and that is that um, instead of doing one marketing plan per small business, do a marketing plan for an industry and give it a brand. And so ultimately Red Balloon 
uh, is a brand platform for small businesses. And when they um, uh, are curated onto our platform, it gives them a certain sense, not just of authority, but also regular income and customers just keep coming over and over again. Um, I believe in experiences. I think there's too much stuff on the planet. You know, how many businesses are importing things from faraway lands and then they end up sitting on a shelf or breaking and they just end up landfill. And the cost to the planet is too great. And on the flip side of that, we also know that experiences are, um, are valued more than things because time is our most precious resource. So hanging out with people that you love and doing things together is unbelievably mem- memorable. So um, so I remain absolutely passionate, but, you know, it was that typical startup story from home, had no money, shoestring, um, you know, got it to a certain size in about 2011, was turning over about $50 million, and then it was like, oh, it just seemed to plateau and plateau and plateau. And, and then I joined with my business partner, David Anderson, and we created Big Red Group and decided to roll up the industry. And as soon as you have a material size, you also have the resources to be able to invest the capital in doing the transformation. And so now that platform is um, rolling out and, and we partner with incredible organisations and in, including recently launching Virgin Experiences um, platform in Virgin Australia So um, with one of our brands. So you can now buy our experiences through uh, Virgin. In fact, I think now nine of ten searches in Australia for any experience, you'll come across one of our platforms. So if someone's had an adventurous experience in Australia, they've probably interacted with one of your brands. Yeah, if they haven't bought directly from the um, supplier, it will have come probably from one of our platforms. That's fascinating. How does it feel to be involved in so many Australians' lives and the way they're gifting and relating and sharing with each other? Look, it's it, it never um, ceases to amaze me the impact that we're having, and that's two-sided. One is in terms of the small businesses, and, you know, we've had three years of hell in a handbag for anybody who's trying to operate a tourism business, and Quite frankly, um, outbound tourism has uh, inbound tourism. It hasn't come back to full capacity yet. We're a long way from anywhere, and staying on people's shopping list and getting people to stay is hard. So, um, I was speaking to one of our hot air balloon suppliers actually in 2019, just before all of that, and he said, "When we started, Naomi, I had one balloon and 900 passengers. I now have 23 balloons and 19,000 passengers." So he said, "When." somebody comes to the Hunter Valley, it's not just that they come to us. They also go to a hotel, they'll have a meal, they'll probably go to a winery. He said, for, for every $100 that is coming to me, another $900 is going to the community. He goes, you're creating incredible contribution to regional Australia. So when COVID happened, that was one of the things we did. We just went and talked to government. We said, look, airfares and hotel rooms don't drive why people travel. It is all about the experience of what Mm -hmm. makes people travel. And if we want to support regional uh, community and small business, the best way for any business to do it, and it's one of the things I did was go back to big corporates and say, if you want to help small business, just buy some vouchers because it's not just our customers that get supported, it's all of that community gets supported. And so that's what we can do. So that's really purposeful when you see the economic impact you're having um, in small businesses. And then on the other side, it's the fact that we create these unforgettable moments with people. And like way back in the early day, like I thought I'd started the business for a lifestyle so I could play with the kids in the day and work at night. Well, that doesn't work. So, you know, you're either doing it properly or you're not. Um, but, you know, I did want to run, run a online business because I thought I could just deliver scale and um, and uh, really do something in a different sort of a way. But it's only in reading to customer stories that I've found out the impact that we're having. Um, and this man wrote that for his father's 84th birthday, he gave him a flight on the DC-3. And he said he picked him up and drove him the three hours to the um, Bankstown Airport. And he said he, his father was excited like a little boy going, to a birthday party. And he said, watching my 84-year-old father try and pick up the flight attendants, really embarrassing. Um, 
But, you know, those moments of giggling, and he said his father on the way home shared with him that as a young man he'd heard the first DC-3 flight on the wireless and he'd always wanted to be on one. He said, my father is a very quiet man. I'll always remember today as one of the days he spoke. So when you understand that human impact, you just keep going. And I will never know the impact that all of our businesses have had, let alone Red Balloon in the gifting space. Mm. I'll never know, but you don't need to know. So when it comes to your customers, I'm presuming that you had to go through some big changes through COVID to get through that season. Did it feel like you had to sort of throw out the old playbook and bring a new one and keep adapting and changing during that season? I'm super proud of our team. Like it really was incredible. We're all living in fear and we've kind of forgotten. But that moment when the World Health Organization announced a pandemic, which was the 11th of March, our sales just dropped off the planet. Mm. And what that meant was nobody could go on on activities and we had 3,500 small businesses who are dependent on us. And so the first thing we did was we rushed out to, and remember, like there's 700,000 people who are holding a red balloon voucher in any given moment wanting to use it. So if we're, you know, and they're sitting at home frustrated going, oh, I'm bored, and also with this sense of doubt about money, well, they're like, I've got a voucher, how do I use that? So we went straight back to the 3,500 and said, is there anything that you can do virtually or delivered in a box? And we were super excited that we managed to get 250 new experiences live within about three weeks. Um, One of them was Little Tiny Bear in Victoria, which is a gin distillery, and they had been hosting gin tours and so forth. But they did this gin tasting in a box. And um, and he said, you know, I'm sending them all over the country and they've got, had cocktails and things and then they could, they had a virtual experience of how to make cocktails. And he said, you know, I'm getting 80 people on the call, whereas I only ever used to get eight or so people on the tour. So he, he had to employ two people to help him with the pick and pack and the growth of that business. And most of those products are actually still there because they provided an incremental business stream using a different set of assets for those small businesses. So it was really um, quite incredible. And um, then, so that was the one thing. The second thing that we did, uh, obviously I started working in B2B again and started talking to corporates and said, best way you can support small business buying vouchers. But we invested in our systems and there was two things that we did to keep our customers close. One is that we made vouchers automatically valid for five years thinking we've got to be out of this in five years' time. And we backdated that to any other voucher. (laughs) So unlike a certain airline who will remain nameless, our job is to get customers to those small businesses. That's our Mm -hmm. job. And um, but it just took all of the pressure off our contact centre and call centre, like just immediately. And it also says these people are good people. They really want us to go on that activity. Now, Of course, a small business supplier might not be able to hold the value or the price of that experience for five years because we have an obligation to make sure that our suppliers are um, financially, um, you know, functional. And so we would just swap it into the value. So they might have had to top it up for 10 bucks or whatever um, um, if those prices had changed, but they got the full value of that voucher available to them for five years. So that was really important um, and making that absolutely seamless. The other thing we did was invest in the technology that if something happened, we could literally freeze every voucher or every booking. And we did this across all of our brands. So, for instance, there's a certain state in Australia who's pretty prone to locking their people in the house. And, um, like, who puts... We had 14,000 bookings for Valentine's Day in 2021. I think it was 2021. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the government at the time decides on the Friday to cancel Valentine's Day. We had 14,000 bookings in Victoria that day. And so we automatically press, press a button, we automatically cancel everybody's bookings, and we automatically reissued them a voucher. And then once, and that was called freeze, and then once we were thawing, we sent an email to all of those people saying, take your time, but book yourself in again. And and that, again, just took all of the pressure off our our contact center. 
Um, but, but B, people knew that we were looking after them and that they, you know, and they had something to look forward to. Mm. Again, not like another airline. And we're tiny in the scheme of things. Like I do not understand why they have not invested their t- technology to, like if we can do it, surely a massive billion, billion dollar business can do that. And that that just comes back from our sense of purpose. Our purpose is to shift the way people experience life. That includes how they interact with us. Our job is to make life easy for them, not to add to their stresses of life. It's interesting seeing how all of those small moments really go towards that customer experience because instead of having to chase a refund for months and months and months, you automatically cancelled it because people couldn't do anything and gave them a voucher back so that they had a really positive experience and they were going to keep interacting with the platform in the future, which is cool to see. And I guess pivoting a little bit to to more of you and your own journey, one of the things I was interested from a personal finance perspective is just on your entrepreneurial small business journey when you were starting up, how did that interact with your own personal finances from a high level? Did it make you more risk adverse? Did you feel like more like jumping into the deep end? How, how did it shape your perspective there? Um, look, I spent $25,000 of family savings and, you know, didn't have a customer for two months and four days. That was a little stressful in our household, just say. Um, and that's a lot of money, especially back in those days. Like that was a lot of money. Um, but there's a really great book called Customer Funded Business Models. And if you think about it, if you can get your customers to fund your growth, then you're, you know, you're a long way there. And so when startups come to me and they say, oh, I really want investment, I say, well, who is the best investor? Your best investor is the people who believe in you. Who believes in you is your customers. So when you understand how cash flows through a business and where the bottlenecks are and you really work on those bottlenecks, um, the hardest thing for most small businesses is working capital. That is they have to pay their suppliers before they get the revenue in from the customers, which is also why the government has such a focus on large businesses reporting on their small business payment times because small business is not a bank. And I have watched so many of the small businesses literally go out of business because they cannot fund that working capital. Mm-hmm. And um, it's it's so sad. So I guess one of the things was I don't hold stock. I don't have to buy stock. Um, I just have to have really great relationships to ensure that, that they deliver really great experiences. And those vouchers are valid for now five years, but back in the first it was only six months. Um, and then we realised that actually if we gave them 12 months, that would be better. And then the New South Wales government changed the law to three years and then we just upped it because of COVID to five. But what that does mean is that people might be paying us, um, the majority of people go on their activity in the first three months. In fact, more than half go in the first month. Like it's, oh, wow. so we can cash out the door, you know, quickly. Um, but even so, we pay our suppliers within five days either side of the actual booking and that is completely transformational for them so that means they're never waiting for cash and that means they give incredible uh customer service to our customers and they're going to have a wonderful experience because they know it's a pipeline so thinking just so so if i'm getting cash in and then i'm able to send it out that that is um, that is a wonderful way of growing a of growing a business. Um, it's effectively what um, the airlines do as well. You know, they want you to book your air, air fares twelve months in advance. Yeah, and they hold that on their balance sheet as a liability, and then they don't move it into their revenue line until it, it comes in. It's not unusual. All ticketing organisations work that way. Mm, but five day payment terms for you paying the small business is quite different, isn't it? Because I hear a lot of companies they have to wait thirty days to be paid from from the larger companies for their stock when it's delivered and things like that. Oh, it's worse than that. It's ninety days. Um, another big retailer when I was working with those Shark Tank businesses, they would say we'll pay you in one hundred and twenty days, but we'll help you fund that debt and we will factor that debt and take an extra two percent. And I was like. That's that's just criminal. That's just absolutely criminal. You're just gouging these small businesses by factoring their debt. Honestly, great for the big retailer 
who is getting paid at the time that that leaves, but they're using though their small business suppliers literally as a bank, and it's disgraceful. Mm. I spent a bit of time uh, working for an invoice finance company, and uh, it was very interesting seeing how how long the payment terms were and uh, the ethics involved there were a little bit dubious, I think. <laughs> I remember, and I'll say because it was a foreign uh, business, it was a French business, and I say that only because it's kind of um, because we negotiated a contact to deliver experiences for their recognition program and they were buying, I don't know, a good amount every month. And I had said, we pay our suppliers on the time and I'm not going to fund this and you, we will give you seven days, like seven days, that's it. And then, you know, that came to 14 and then it was up to like 120, like, and you know, I'm kind of going, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And the CFO, who was not residing in Australia but somewhere else, says that person didn't have the response, couldn't make that. We only pay in 120 days. And I said, mate, I don't care. This is Australia. I'm turning off every single one of those vouchers because you haven't paid for them. So, therefore, they're not yours. And he goes, you can't do that. And I go, yes, I can. Watch me. So, you know, I literally had to hold... I watched this space gun to his head. Um, and also that's a foreign national designing um, foreign, uh, you know, doing the finance policy in Australia, which does not comply with the Australian laws uh, mm. or best practice. And so, uh, you know, at least I had some, uh, but that was unbelievably stressful. And I said, why, you know, this is a billion, billion dollar euro business. Why should I fund them? Why? Why should I then put that pressure on, on my own enterprise? So never. It's not fair. Mm. This is mm. the one thing that gets me going every time. Pay. <laughs> Payment terms. <laughs> yes. And um, that's because most businesses just don't have any power in that conversation. Yeah. And it's not fair. Just a little respect. Give them a fair go. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I think that's a, that's a good hill to die on. Uh, we, at the start, you mentioned that you weren't that keen on the word entrepreneur. And when I met you at the event, you were talking about how you call yourself a business owner. And there's a lot of conversation about entrepreneurs and venture capital and unicorns and all of this startup money. Do you think that has distracted us from the ability to create good businesses that support our communities? Do you think there's just too much attention on all of the the shiny, sparkly stuff and not enough on creating businesses that give back value to their community? I, I just don't like this notion of celebrity and um, that entrepreneurs are somehow in any way special or different. Most, um, most people who start a business and grow a business, they see an opportunity and a trend. It's not that they're particularly special. So if we look at the founders of Airbnb, um, they had this idea, nothing happened to that business until the global financial crisis when money was short and people said, yeah, I'll have a stranger in my spare room if I can earn an extra 100 bucks." Not understanding that they would fundamentally change the social structure and accommodation in our, in, in, in our country. You know, there was an article about what goes on in Bright, that 690 houses on Airbnb and if you're going to work there as a teacher, you can't find anywhere to live. And what what it's doing to the rental capacity in our cities is terrible and we have to legislate, we have to do something. The social consequences of that are far too great and the orig original concept of I've got a little bit of spare space versus people holding literally hundreds of units and renting them out on Airbnb is, is A, not the original intention. So, uh, I kind of digress, but you can see this kind of notion of more, more, more. What we've seen go on recently with um, um, OpenAI and the CEO, and, you know, I don't know what went on with that board and why they've done a backflip, but they saw some governance issue going on. But what we have is a founder that is living on popularity and one must believe in the company, not the person. It's what we do for other people. And I've been very deliberate 
about stepping out of an operational role. I have not worked in our businesses for many years. As I said, I stepped in during COVID to run our B2B team because, of course, it's my you know biggest asset. Of course, I'm going to be involved when it's in need. But we don't want people to work for any of our businesses because they want to work with me because I happen to be on the telly at some point. And that's not what it's about. I, I was on the telly because I wanted to be a role model, not because I wanted to be famous. In fact, that's why I didn't do it anymore because I that, that my reputation is really important to me and the fact that, you know, some cryptocurrency takes my image and says I invested in it and all of that false advertising stuff, not on, won't do it, mm-hmm. can't stand it. So one has to protect one's reputation. So I'm very... I'm very concerned that also um, startups in any community compare themselves to what they're calling these unicorns. Um, I was speaking to a young founder in Sydney. She's got a wonderful business and she took um, she took VC capital and she said, oh, my goodness, they think they know my business better than me and they keep telling me what to do. I wish I'd never taken the money. I would have rather stay small. And, you know, there's this, this tension in the room, but, you know, she had this great aspiration, if I get the right VC partner, I can go on this journey. Um, I know for a fact that um, the Shoes of Prey founders, when they had that business, they'd been diluted so much, it wasn't even worth them staying around anymore. Like they had tiny percentages because they'd done so many raises and they'd had so many haircuts. So, you know, it's a fine balance between making sure that a founder doesn't become a, you know, icon and that they're not famous for famous sakes because they can string three words together, Um, that the fundamentals of the business are there. And I would argue that the governance and regulation and making sure that we are complying are really, really important. Do you think there's a risk that someone wanting to start a small business thinks that they can't do it unless they have a strong brand and personality and their own personal fame? Um, unfortunately, I think people do compare themselves and that causes a sense of distress and upset and, and you know, oh, his business is bigger than mine, oh, we started at the same time. It's not, it's not a competition. There's a really beautiful book called um, Small Giants and it's about businesses who are, are wonderful but choose to be small. You know, they just have a boutique offering for their local community and they're highly profitable, but they chose not to take their concept and create it 600 times all over America. So I think, you know, we need to know who we are as leaders and what we stand for and what's important to us. What drove us for growth was the fact that if we didn't do it well and keep doing it well and we had to be of a certain scale to be able to fund capital investments, then somebody else, and it would have been a global player, would take that space. And we didn't want to leave it to someone else. So uh, I think I think we have to personality, like, you know, I've obviously got out in front of the business because it was easy at the time, but it's not, it's not the future of the business. It's, it's very important that a, it's a business that people attach to, not a personality. Yeah, because I guess the mistake people can make is thinking they have to keep growing the business. They start at all costs. They can't just choose to stay small and stay local. That almost seems like a the wrong choice to make, doesn't it? Yes, but also just knowing, like I'm very clear of what my non-strengths are as well as my strengths. And truly a business comes to a certain point where it's a very different skill set. You know, I'm very good at creating vision and lets you unite everybody to the cause, but it's a very detailed and complex business and you need detailed and, and not complex people, but people who can cope with uh, very complex issues to be able to work on that. You know, I tend to uh, operate in uh, at, at a very high level. Well, you need people in the detail. I feel very fortunate. Gemma Farson has just worked with me since I started the business from home. Um, she's our, she works on the leadership team still. She um, And she used to always say she's the detail in my devil. You know, t- there's different skill sets required, but the sorts of skills that are needed now in what is a material size business are very different than mine. For someone listening that's thinking or has just started a small local business in Australia, what piece of advice would you have for them? Um, I, I think it's really important. I wrote a book called Ready to Soar about whether you're up for this journey. Um, and 
there's different levels of innate risk that people will be prepared to take. And you've really got to know your own boundaries. Like what is it that under no circumstances do you refinance the house, for instance, under no circumstances? And so unfortunately, I've literally seen entrepreneurs who've got an exit, then they've spent every single dollar they got on a new enterprise thinking they're very clever and then putting everything they own into that new enterprise and ending up with nothing. And so um, as I said, it's, it's often the time and the timing that creates a business opportunity. It's not necessarily the personality. So I'm really clear about what I can contribute versus uh, if I was, uh, you know, people say, won't you do another Starbucks Hub? And I was like, no, why? It's hard. It's a long journey. Um, I have very different uh, ways that I am contributing to our community now. Yeah, I think that's the message that often gets missed is the hard work, the years that you have to put into it. It's not an overnight success, whether it's a small business or a, or a huge business. It takes a lot of blood, sweat and tears. It really does. And, you know, we're um, and small business owners are battling on every front, every front. It's uh, whether it's compliance and regulation, cash issues, whether it's people, how do I get great people to align with what we said we're going to do around here, um, technology, how do I stay abreast, what's right for me. It's, it's, there's a lot going on continually. Now that you've stepped back a bit from the day-to-day running of the business and you're thinking more about leadership and helping give back to the community, how do you think about what kind of legacy you want to leave? Oh, look, my legacy... Oh, gosh, such a big word, legacy. What do I want my legacy to be? Um, I guess my legacy is all the young people who chose to study business when they might not have even considered it. Uh, And I had a grandmother come up to me at the cricket last year and she was holding her granddaughter's heart. She wants to be like you. She's going to be doing business. And I was doing a speaking engagement in The Hunter and this woman came up to me and she said, you were always my favourite on Shark Tank. I watched you when I was in high school. And she said, and I'm just about to finish my commerce degree. So, you know, I guess that's the point is I will never know who Mm. I impacted to kind of give something a go that they might never have considered. And I think that that will be the legacy. But, you know, I'll never know and it's fine. And to wrap up today's conversation, I was wondering if, You had to leave listeners with one thing to take away from today's conversation and from all of your years of wisdom and experience. What would that be? It's so funny you say that because I'd say it's the one thing. Like what is the one thing that you should be working on in your business life right now or your personal life? Like what is the one thing? Um, In fact, that's a a book uh, called The One Thing. The one thing you should be working on is the thing that when you do it, everything else becomes easier. And, uh, and I've, I've tackled that so many times. So the one thing is always, then I'll give you an example. Um, people pitch me business ideas all the time. Um, can people imagine. pitch my kids' business ideas all the time. Say, so ask your mum what she thinks of this. <laughs> and I have terrible. to answer that. Yeah, I have to answer that really responsibly because if I say oh, it sounds good, they might spend their whole life savings and 17 years of their life. Yeah. And so, and I wouldn't know. Like how would I know? I'm just like everybody else as a consumer. You know, I don't know who their audience is. I don't know what their um, financial model looks like. I don't know anything. An idea is not a business, so I wouldn't know. And so but because I said I was going to be a role model and I was thinking about all of those people who pitched and we had like 100 pitches a season, not all of them made it to air. Um, and I I wrote the book Ready to Soar because I had to answer the question responsibly because I said I was going to be a role model. So now every time somebody pitches me, I just say, did you read Ready to Soar? And if they say yes or no, I just go, well, read it. Because if you're not curious enough to learn and read a book, you are not an entrepreneur. You know, you would want to devour that book and have it all underlined and everything. And, and then then maybe it is for you. So my one thing was writing 86,000 words, but then I could answer that question and I was getting lots and lots of them. So it saved me so much time. 
So your one thing might be a really big thing. It might be a system. It might be a process. It might be something. But just work on your one thing. Get it done and everything else will become easier. I love this. Well, Naomi, this conversation has been full of so many gems and resources, and I think it'll give everyone something to go on or at least something to focus on their one thing. And if people want to chase you down, read your books, find you on the internet, where should they head to? Oh, look, just come to my blog, naomisimpson.com. <laughs> and, um, and you know, you can contact me there if you want me as a speaker or you want me to do whatever. Um, and in, on the website, you'll find links. I think all my books actually are out of print now. Uh, I had a really good run with them, but I think you can still get them as, um, or, um, you know, like Kindle books and stuff like that on yeah, Amazon. Yeah, e-books and things like that. E-get, you can still get the e-books, yeah. And you're the most followed woman in Australia on LinkedIn or person, just full yeah. stop. I know, because maybe it's because I'm the funniest. I don't know. No, that's that's a, that is obviously another story. Um, but I, I, when they launch content on LinkedIn, they ask two Australians, and I wrote a few um, blog posts because I've been blogging for years. I wrote a few blog posts that were really quite um, pithy and um, a, about career stuff and so forth, and um, and they just took off. But now the problem that we've got is that everybody's blogging. There's so much content. You actually don't know what is good and what's not good anymore. Mm. It's so hard to get real clarity. So um, I think it's kind of overwhelming for people. So I don't write as much as I used to. But I do have my own podcast, or there's something, uh, which is called Handpicked. And um, maybe we should put a link in for that too. But Handpicked, yeah. I should forget, should I? Oh, that's right, I've got a book, podcast. But that's where <laughs> business owners interview me about their problems. Oh. So that, for instance, one woman said, well, how do I put up my prices? And I talked through with her the sorts of considerations and how she would look at that. Mm. Uh, another person asked me the question, should I share my revenue with my staff? You know, they think I'm just getting rich. I said, it's a fuller, you know, m- model you've got to let them know where all the expenses go as well if you're going to share the top line so yeah people ask me their business questions forgot about that handpicked well, that sounds perfect if someone listening is interested in starting a business or is running that they can learn directly from you and i think that's the the wonderful part of podcasts is that you can have one conversation and so many people can learn from it well naomi thank you so much for all your time and being so generous today i'll put all the links that we've talked about today in the show notes so listeners can learn more but just thank you so much for coming on the show so my pleasure thanks for having me kate thanks for listening to this episode of the australian business podcast I think this series is best served with my free business course on RASC Education. My free course includes all of my notes, templates, employment guides, legal documents, marketing strategies, software recommendation, and ideas for starting and running a small business. Finally, if this podcast or the course helps you, I only ask that you please help me by sharing it with one friend, colleague, or family member who runs a business. Thanks for listening. This episode of the Australian Business Podcast is proudly supported by Rumble Coffee Roasters. Rumble Coffee Roasters is dedicated to helping you drink better coffee. Knockout blends, world-class, single origins, bold espressos, and flavor-filled filter roasts. Rumble Coffee prides itself on personal relationships with producers and customers alike. They pay farmers fairly so that they can invest in their land, their employees, and their communities. You can buy some beans to drink at home via rumblecoffee.com.au. That's R-U-M-B-L-E coffee.com.au. Or if you're a coffee shop owner, get in touch and discover better ways to serve your customers. Tell them Rask sent you. This episode is proudly supported by Rask Core. Rask Core is our all-in-one membership service designed to help you get the most from your money. Complete with research on ETFs, individual shares, bank accounts, term deposits, and so much more. Over 4,000 people are part of the Rascor community, and it is growing every week. To learn why more investors choose Rascor, head to www.rask.com.au slash subscriptions to find out more.